those that weren't here yesterday uh, and may have missed Peter in any capacity, uh, my best description of Peter is a man who can talk about community and community engagement in real terms, uh, in language that is easy to understand. There's no academic fluff. It's all about hand grenades into the system, from what I understand, Peter. So uh, I would just like to bring Peter up and uh, hand over the reins, and he'll take you through uh, until morning tea and then after until lunchtime. Peter, Great. welcome. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, John. And I wonder whether we can just acknowledge John and his team for an amazing workshop. I mean, he, uh, he shared that he didn't sleep at all last night. So that's the, uh, the uh, legacy of these things, John. But you've done a brilliant job. Thanks very much. Um, look, it's exciting to be here to talk about uh, my favourite uh, theme. And it's a thing called community. And as I said yesterday, I think after family, to me, nothing more matters than this thing called community. But I want to begin by just also acknowledging the traditional owners of the land. And I don't do this out of tokenism, and I don't do it because you're meant to at the start of any conference. I do it out of profound respect for the fact that we and my family have an 80-year connection to this continent, but I can claim friends now who can claim a 65,000-year connection. We are privileged, I think, to enjoy this country because for over 65,000, close on 70,000 years, an amazing group of people have been amazing stewards of this land. And so I really do want to just acknowledge them and acknowledge also that incredible network of tribes and nations across this country that enable us to enjoy this place called Australia. And I offer to their, lead, to their uh, leaders today, past and present, kind of like my profound respect for being able to enjoy it. Um, I also love to share it because I had a profound experience at a place called Kakadu. Anyone been to Kakadu? What do you think of Kakadu? Great. Great. Yeah. What else? Anything else about it? No one else been there? Well, listen, before you die, you've got to go to Kakadu. It's the most amazing place. It's mesmerising, has a spirituality about it. Just one of those great parts of this particular continent. But within it is the oldest settlement in, uh, the northern, in uh, that part of the world. It's called Mudjan Bardi. It was an old abattoir. It's quite famous because a very uh, key legal case between the unions and the cattle workers happened there. And a guy called Peter Costello, it was his very first kind of like place he came to prominence when he won an amazing case against the, uh, the union of the day. But today it's the home of the Mirror People. What is very sad, though, about the Mirror People, they're the traditional owners of Kakadu, but there's only 37 of them left. Um, they have been decimated by disease and a whole pile of other issues. But the Mirror people are quite unique in the fact they're one of the only groups to know who actually own a uranium mine, um, for which they have received millions upon millions of dollars in royalties. What I admire, though, about the Mirror people is ever since that mine was thrust upon them, they have actively campaigned for its closure because they believe it's an intrusion on country. And I respect them greatly for that because they have been immense beneficiaries from the royalties paid, literally tens of millions of dollars every year. About six, seven years ago, I was invited to kind of like come in to this particular community. I just spent three years working in Somalia, which is probably the most dysfunctional country on the face of the earth. But when I drove into this place, I thought, you know what, I hadn't seen kind of like issues in North Africa that I saw there. This was a trash community. And the question I had in my mind is, where's all the money gone? And every day I spent time in that particular community, what they referred to as the Toyota Cavalry would drive into the place, all in the name of helping them. And yet, there were immense health issues there that I hadn't seen in Africa. No children in the community went to school, and hardly anyone in that community had a job outside the community. Domestic violence, alcoholism were kind of like rampant. And yet, millions of dollars had been poured in here, and every day the Toyota Cavalry would come charging into the place, all in the name of helping. And yet, this place was dysfunctional. But what I admired about the Mirror people is they said, Peter, can we have a new conversation? Everyone wants to turn up here and talk about what's wrong. Could we start with a new conversation 
And instead of asking what's wrong, can we begin with what's strong? What works in the place, not what doesn't work? We don't need any more conversations about what doesn't work. We can see that. We know it. It takes us 20 seconds to do a needs map of what's needed. But we've never had conversations about what works in the community. Why is it that you guys have this community development model that's all about the half-empty bit of the glass? Why don't we have a conversation about the half-full bit of the glass? Why don't we start with what works and what's strong here rather than what's wrong? And I suppose that was the first thing I learned. Wow, we need to change the conversation. You want to get people excited about being part of this thing called community development, don't start with what's wrong. That just kind of gets people talking down. Start with what's strong, what works. What's that kind of like half full bit of the glass? And so they said, secondly, Peter, can we have no more meetings? You white people are paranoid about calling meetings. Can we use the oldest tool that we know? It's called conversation. Can we have conversations rather than meetings? And so over a period of three or four months, we just started, wherever it seemed appropriate, gathering in small groups and started talking about what works in the community and what does people care about in that community and what is it that each person brings to kind of like the equation. And so it was an amazing thing where people then started talking about what they had. For example, this amazing physical asset, their, their billabong that was really in the heart of the community and people saying, you know what, that's got amazing tourism potential. Why don't we start looking at what we could do there to generate some jobs through tourism? I'll never forget one day standing up there on the rocks near that uh, railing. There was a group of women and children swimming and a crocodile uh, appears between them and eats the dog on the shore. Now, I've never seen anything like that. This was unbelievable crocodile, come, uh, crocodile Dundee country. This was an amazing kind of like place where you could really experience the outback. And then there were people in that community like Mark. Now, Mark is one of the best artists in the Northern Territory. But the more that our friendship developed, the more I realised that art wasn't Mark's number one passion. His number one passion was horse riding. He'd been raised on a cattle station. He believed passionately the relationship between a young man and his horse was probably the most powerful relationship forming of behaviour you could ever get. And his dream for his community was to start up a horseback tourism business. Not just because it was a way of generating jobs, but for him his passion was about getting his young men in particular connected to a horse which he believed was a rather strange but wonderful way of character formation. And so each person in that community started talking about what they cared about, what their dream was. What is it that they cared enough about? They'd be willing to become part of actually making things happen. And so through that, what we often in technical language call the asset mapping of what was going on, they started to plot it. Now to them, it isn't about putting down on paper a strategic plan. Their way of capturing where they wanted to go and where they were at and where they could get to was to start to put that down in terms of a diagram. And slowly that group started to evolve their kind of like strategy of where it went. And ultimately that was kind of like conveyed into that particular painting which is their vision of where it was. Now what I love about that particular vision is it was their vision where they wanted to go. And so the very first question was, what is it about that though that we can do ourselves? We don't need the Toyota Cavalry to do it. We have got the funds and we certainly have the passion and the skills. So you notice at the top there that they had a dream to reintroduce to that community a horticultural kind of like garden of tropical fruits. They had people in that community who could still remember when the community had such a, a garden. They had people in that community who knew how to get, do the gardening. They had people in that community who could put up the fences to keep the roos and the, and the emus out. They didn't need any help. And so that was the first question. Second question is, what is it about our, our vision that we could do with some assistance? And certainly they wanted to get that horseback tourism business kind of like running. But they did need some help from the tourism department to try to define the market and where and how they could get people into the community. And so there was some technical help that they really needed. 
And thirdly, what is it about that picture that we know we can't do and we do need an outside service to come and help us? And there were health issues in that community that they certainly did need people from a health background in to kind of like do for them. And I suppose what that taught me was that's the order. Our way is always to go to people and say, what's the matter? And we're here to help you. You know what the question needs to be? What matters to you? What matters to you? And what is it you can do before we start talking about what others can do? And that really is at the heart of what community development has always meant to be on about. But somehow we've twisted it over the last kind of like 50 years to where we do so much to and for community when we really need to get back to the art of doing things with and above all creating space of, of and by the community themselves. You will never build strong communities from the top down and the outside in. It needs to be an inside out job and people in that community need to be active participants. The consequence is that people become spectators. The consequence is that people develop an attitude of entitlement. When are they, and I haven't quite worked out who they is yet, going to do things for us? And we have helped to create that with some of the practices out of service land that we perhaps need to kind of like change. And so today we want to talk about this new approach, which I don't think is new. I think it's getting back to what traditionally community development or what I prefer to call community building, has actually all been about. The ultimate thing that happened there is that friendships started to happen the longer I was there. And one of the things I learned is that the heart of community building is relationship building. It's fundamentally all about building relationships. And Jonathan and I started to develop a friendship because we had a shared passion. Both of us a diehard Frio Docker football supporters. And so we would often find ourselves kicking that little bit of leather between each other as the sun came down. And through that particular friendship, I ultimately was given the ultimate kind of like uh, compliment. And Jonathan said, would you like to come for me for a walk on country? I want to show you my country. He forgot to tell me it was like 12 kilometers and it almost killed me. But we kind of like wandered and eventually we came to this amazing outcrop. And he said to me, Peter, what do you think of this place? And, you know, like all of Kakadu, you could see as far as the eye could see and it was amazing. And so I started to mouth all those things. It's mesmerizing. It's beautiful. It's really wonderful. And eventually he stopped me and said, Peter, it is all those things. But I just want to tell you one other thing. We've just had archaeologists here. And they claim that where you and I are sitting is the oldest known settlement site in the world. Is that one of those assets that you're talking about? I almost fell off the rock. Here is the oldest known settlement site. You know how old it is? 55,000 years ago. And there, within their community, they had that. And he turned to me and said, Peter, is that one of those assets that you keep talking about? Amazing. And we are privileged to kind of like be kind of like co-inheritors of such wonderful things. Key learnings for me are really at the heart of what all this is about. Let's start with what is strong, not what is wrong. Secondly, many community assets remain hidden. And probably our role as a community facilitator is to kind of like make the invisible become visible. Community building I think is not usually about new discovery. It's about having fresh eyes about what we've always got. And so often in community, and they may be geographic or communities of interest, we become blasé about what we've got and we need to somehow get the scales off. And maybe part of our role as a facilitator of community development is helping people to develop fresh eyes about what they had. Thirdly, what I've discovered is no one is apathetic about everything. Everyone cares about something, and what people care about is their motivation to act. And if we've got a key role to play, it's that. It is about how do we get people and how do we begin to discover what it is that people care about. And then who else cares about that and how we might begin to bring those people together to act upon it. 
Their motivation to act is always what they care about. Fourthly, I certainly learned that we need more conversations and less meetings. And a conversation is really about dialogue, it's about exchange, it's about listening and not just talking. It's about discovering and learning from each other. Fifthly, what we need is less services and more community. So much of what we do, and this is part of the grenades I'll keep throwing into this audience today, is that we connect people to our service, we don't necessarily connect them to community. And what we need today is getting people surrounded and wrapped around by this thing called community. There are a whole pile of things that your services can never do, but community can. And so how do we have less service and more connection? So often people want to tell me what a great job they're doing, but when they describe it, they're fundamentally connecting people to the heart of their service. What we need to be doing is how do we connect people to the heart of their community? And that may not necessarily be the same thing. And finally, every community is incredibly asset rich. They are what I call reservoirs of untapped possibility. And really, our role as a facilitator is to make those assets come alive, begin to connect them, not just give a map of what they are and a list of everything. That's an audit. That's of no use. What asset mapping is really about is beginning to see connections and between those assets. And that very much is what really this whole workshop's about. So those of you who've got a busy agenda, it's probably time to go home because you're not going to learn any more. I have an Irish background and we have an interesting way of running workshops. First tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them, then tell them what you've told them. And so that's what's going to happen this morning. You're not going to learn much more than that. It's fundamentally about that. If we can just take that away and think about how does that impact upon me, that's at the heart of what all this is about. And I'll be eternally thankful to the Mirror people in Munch and Barty for kind of like teaching me those kind of like simple truths about what true community building I think is all about. Now, this is a workshop that means interaction. There's a whole pile of do's, and if you have a look at all of those do's, they all add up to one thing, and that is, this is our workshop, not my workshop. So at any stage, please feel free to interrupt. If you want to question anything, you want to debate something, you want to ask, kind of like uh, about clarification. And above all, if you've got a story that you want to share that you think illustrates it far better than I can, or just, just makes it come alive, please, please kind of like share it. Because you know what? At the end of the day, I do believe that storytelling is by far the most powerful way to get messages across. Not data, not spreadsheets, not kind of like more information, but stories. We will forget the theory of today, but I'm sure some of you will remember the stories that have actually been shared. We never forget a good story. And so storytelling, I think, is one of the most powerful tools we can use in community building. And the session, which the practice to the, the, the session before morning tea is going to be the theory stuff. The session after morning tea is more where we'll get into doing and workshopping some of the stuff in reality. And one of the things we want to talk about is storytelling. What does a good story really look like? And finally, there's only one kind of like don't, and I wouldn't take a lot of notes. Because if anyone want all of the 247 slides I'll use this morning, and they can be we transferred to you if you just give me your card, I'll make sure you get them. I'll also refer you through to our website, which a whole pile of handouts, close on 200 of them are there that you can download. Now, we operate on copy left, not copy right, which means you can rip off everything, put your name on it, modify it, change it. Every one of our handouts is kind of like changeable. That's our copy left kind of like policy. In fact, we used to have in there quoted, reprinted, stolen, given away, and we had the local police station ring us saying, Peter, we've just been checking your website. You know it's against the law to advocate stealing? Do you think you could actually change it? And the fact that the local coppers were kind of like looking at it, we thought it was worth changing, so we had to do that. So it's all there. I'm going to talk about a whole pile of tools this afternoon. And on our website, it's a whole page of two-page summaries of how you can actually use that particular tool. In particular, 
we've developed up a handbook that's simply called Practical Techniques and Tools for Engaging Community. It contains 37 different tools you can use, and that is on that, uh, on that particular website, and you can just download, download that 52-page book, and uh, everything is actually there. Any questions about the workshop? Happy with that? Okay. How many Winnie the Pooh people do we have left in the audience? How many wonderful people of culture? We have got seven cultural people here who understand real culture. I'm a real Winnie the Pooh fan. I love some of them. And one of my favourites is this. Here is Edward Bear coming downstairs now, bump, bump on the back of his head behind Christopher Robin. It is, as far as he knows, the only way of coming down the stairs. But sometimes he feels there's another way. If he can only stop bumping for a moment and think of it. And my desire and prayer for every one of us today is that this is a couple of hours of non-bumping time. We've turned off our phone. We're not in the office. We've got a chance to kind of like look at what we're doing through the eyes of this workshop and begin to ask ourselves, is there a smarter... Is there a different, is there a better way that we can actually function as a community builder? And I suppose that is really my desire for this particular workshop. I am excited, though, that we are going to focus on this thing called community. And probably the starting point, if we want to talk about what does community development mean or community building, I think the first thing we've got to ask ourselves is if we are interested in building healthy, caring, engaged, inclusive communities, well, what do those type of places look like? What goes on in an inclusive, engaged, caring community? What do they look like? What are the behaviours? What are the attitudes of places like that? Whether it be geographic or whether it be a community of interest. So can we just throw our thoughts around? What do you think a caring, engaged, healthy community looks like? Anyone got any ideas? What, what goes on in these places? I mean, if this is what we're building, surely we need to know what we're wanting to build. So what do you think these places look like? How do they act? Sorry, people are? People are connected. What do you mean by that? They feel connected? Yep. So there's a lot of personal connection. People are really related. And as I said yesterday, we're really in trouble because only one in three people in Australia can even tell you the name of their two neighbours on either side. We certainly aren't connected like we used to be. found it really, really, uh, it was lovely, to, uh, not lovely, I think it was embarrassing, but there's a great story. The, the head of the Municipal Association of Australia last year is now on an assault charge because he attacked his neighbour over the fence threw a cup of hot coffee over him because the guy was watering his lawn and was watering part of his driveway. Now, this is the guy who heads local government in Australia and he's now on the salt charge. Turns out he didn't even know the name of the neighbour. I'm sure if you had a friendship and you know people, you're not likely to throw a cup of coffee over them because they are watering your driveway. What a strange world we live in. So we're not that connected after all. So connection is really important. What else? People feel safe. And without doubt, that's a huge issue um, why people want to move to the country. You know, they want that feeling once upon a time where their kids can pedal to the sun goes down and the whole village looked after them and there was a sense of safety. That's a strong community. What else? Um, they celebrate. They celebrate. Yeah, the and they yep. A lot of pride in a, in a connected, healthy community. Lots of celebration. A lot of support for local businesses. Um, a lot of that buy local stuff goes on. You know, people are really proud of where they actually live and try to support and enhance that. What else? Belong. They belong. What do you mean by that? They feel part of the group. Yep, they feel valued. There's no, there's no strangers in a healthy community. Everyone's valued, irrespective of their ethnicity, whether irrespective of their age. Um, irrespective of their physical ability, irrespective of their sexual preference, everyone is valued. Everyone is seen as having a gift and a contribution that the wider community can benefit from and needs. 
That belonging is there. What else? So they... So I just missed that again. What do you mean by that? Need to be able to access your community. Okay, so a strong community is one that we can access. We're aware of the resources of it. We know who to kind of like talk to. We know what resources are available to help us. I think behind that is actually knowing our community. Yep. 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 That's really a sign of a resilient community. That there, there's a lot of use of local asset and resources, and there's a real movement towards that. That whole buy local, support local, all of that stuff is really important. People are identifying what are gaps in the local economy, how we might fill them. That type of stuff goes on. Anything else people want to add? Involvement. Involvement. People are engaged in the business of community. It's not about the same old faces running the community. It's about people get, actually get involved. And so, yeah, what's been shared today is really at the heart of it. And the interesting thing is it ain't rocket science stuff about what builds a strong community. We've had the opportunity of looking at 200 studies that have been done on what's a strong community, a caring community, a resilient community, an inclusive community. And you know what they all say? They're all on about the same thing. It's not rocket science stuff. The one I love that I think summarises it very well is one called Healthy Cities and Communities Coalition. It's based in the States, but a pile of local governments in Australia are a part of it. They did 4,000 consultations across North America in Canada and US, and they asked people, tell us, what do you think a healthy community looks like, feels like, acts like? And at the end of those 4,000 consultations, they said seven themes seemed to emerge that were important. And I think that's not a bad checklist. And I wonder whether that's a good description of the communities that you belong to, whether it be a sporting community or a geographic community or a faith community. But first is it practices ongoing dialogue. It means that people are engaged in the business community. People are actively involved. They're not spectators. They're on the ground. They're playing. Secondly, a healthy community generates leadership. It's not on about the same old faces. Had a wonderful experience recently being in a place called Tumbarumba. Anyone been to Tumbarumba? Anyone know where Tumbarumba is? Yeah, sort of southern, New South Wales. southern New South Wales, the Southern Alps. Gorgeous little town of two and a half thousand people. But like most small towns, they suffer from not too many people these days putting up their hands to get involved. All the emergency services are struggling. And the word around town is that young people don't care these days. You know, they're too much busy with their technology to kind of like get involved. A lot of whinging and whining about people getting involved. But this little town has a community bank. Now, to pull off a community bank is quite an achievement. And they're one of them. And each year, that little community bank generates back a financial asset to the community, like close to $125,000 goes back as a financial dividend. And every year, the community would come together and talk about how do we use that additional 125,000 to benefit our town. And about eight years ago, someone said, you know what, we all keep saying that leadership and people getting engaged and people stepping up and, and more people volunteering is a critical challenge for us. What can we do? And someone came up with a really neat suggestion of how to use that money, but also then to fundraise to get more money. And you know what that little town does every second year? It organises for every one and they've got to, who want to, not everyone's forced to do it, but everyone who wants to, their year 11 and 12 students, they organise for them to walk the Kokoda Trail for two weeks. And over the last eight years, 170 young people, 16 and 17 year olds, have walked the Kokoda Trail from that town. 150 residents have joined them in that particular walk. And I tell you, you, go into that town today and there's no shortage of people putting up their hands. If you walk the Kokoda Trail, you discover yourself, you discover teamwork, you discover what leadership's about. You actually become a global citizen and you come back and you want to get engaged in your world. What an amazing 
little initiative for a little town of 2,500 people to kind of like build leadership. Shapes its future, lots of conversations about where are we at, where do we want to get to, what have we got to get there, when will we know that we're there. Those type of questions go on in a healthy community. I love number four, embraces diversity. Everyone is welcome, everyone's needed. Whether age, ethnicity, sexual preference, physical ability. It's a very inclusive place. Number five, knows itself. Now I've actually worked with close on two and a half thousand communities around the globe and I can count on two hands how many of those communities have ever done an asset map of their community. We know how to fill in an application for funding but we don't know how to check our local own assets before we do it. And to me, one of the most important things we've got to help keep communities to do is to asset map. How do we know what we need until we first know what we've got? Seems back to front. You know, we don't go shopping without knowing what we've already got in the cupboard. But when it comes to community, I just know so many communities who can only do anything if someone else pays for it. In Western Australia, we have a thing called Lotteries West. And the joke is, we can't do anything until we've got a Lottery West grant and we know that it's in the mail. Pretty sad way to run community. So a strong community is one that knows itself. It asset maps. And there's at least six critical assets that every community's got. And we need to have a picture of that. We'll talk about that and how we do that this afternoon, or the, uh, after morning tea. And the last two. I think are kind of like the glue that brings all that together. A lot of that is really all about social connection. People belonging, people feeling part of something and whatever. It's interesting to see this recent seven year study in America about why people stay alive. And it's interesting to see the things we put up there. And it's interesting to see which are the two most important of kind of like staying alive and it's strong social integ integration and close relationships. Infinitely more important than the ones that we often give a lot more consideration to. We know how to organise most of the things down the list. The top two we just hope happen. Well the day of hoping needs to change. We need to kind of like make sure that's first and foremost in terms of what we actually do. And so we took all those 200 studies and together with the Municipal Association Victoria, we actually reckon there are probably eight critical behaviours of a healthy, inclusive community. And they are them. It is about practising ongoing dialogue and broad-based participation. It is about fostering that commitment, that pride to community. It's about building collaboration. It's about knowing and building on existing assets. It's about shaping the future. It's about acting with what I call opportunity obsession. You know, a healthy community is constantly looking at opportunities. It's also that mindset one. It's a community that will actually embrace change. Very little what I call this attitude of entitlement in a healthy community. If it's to be, it's up to me type attitude. There's a can do -y type nature about it. And finally, it's one that actively generates leadership. I wonder whether that describes your communities that you belong to. How many of those could you tick off in terms of the fact that you're actively kind of like pursuing them? Because that is what community building is about. We need to know what a strong, inclusive, kind of like engaged community looks like before we try to actually build it. And that very much is the theory. I love what this guy, and he's the guy who founded a thing called Collective Impact. How many people are caught up in a Collective Impact project? A couple of you? Yeah. Well, this is a guy who's taught us Collective Impact is just a wanky term for good old-fashioned collaboration, but it gives us a set of principles. And what John Cannon did very well, he said, community has the power to change everything. No amount of innovation, individual brilliance, or money can transform our broken society as effectively and as sustainably as community building. I really believe it's the most important aspect of what we do today. How do we build kind of like strong communities? Not strengthen, not service community, but strengthen community is what we really need to be focused on. Servicing is part of it, but doesn't equal it. It's a tiny part. 
I'm in a local government and I do not want the local government to tell me to take my rubbish on my own to the tip every week. I like a coordinated rubbish collection system. There is a role for services in a community like that. But there are a whole pile of things my local government could be doing better instead of trying to service community, particularly in this area of community building, that if only they could engage community more and try to strengthen and try to live out those eight principles, we would see stronger communities. So what do we mean by community development? Well, here's two definitions I like. One out of New Zealand. Community development increases opportunities for participation. Love it, right up front. That's the thing we've lost in the last 50 years. Enables the transfer of skills between people, develops self-reliance, builds community capacity, and networks of community groups ensures local ownership of projects and decisions, utilises local resources to solve local problems and increases the social capital available in the community, people's level of intensity and connection to each other. I love it. Doesn't talk about servicing a community at all. Doesn't talk about doing things to and for a community. Talks about building resilience and ownership within the community. This is an inside out, not a top down, outside effort. And the other definition I love is this one. An act of kind of like midwifery of a community giving birth to its future. I love that. The doctor does not kind of like deliver the baby. The mother does. And yet we put so much focus on those who do the servicing. And I think we have done a lot of damage to kind of like community development by what we've done, particularly out of service land. And that, as I showed yesterday, is the result. The difference that we have seen in the last 60 years in Australia, captured so well by all the statistics by this guy, Andrew Lee, my very crude summary on the right, but that is the reality. We are just not connecting like we used to. The system's broken. We need a new way. Not a new way, I think we need to relearn the old way that we used to have. And we've got to begin to question this model that we always start with what's wrong, we always focus from the top down, we always therefore then deliver by a service or a program that we ask community to dance under. You know, uh, I saw yesterday, I was sent a form from the Victorian Innovation Awards. And the first question is, what's the need and problem that you're going to fix? Why do we always need to start there? What's the opportunity that we're going to exploit? What is it we're going to discover? We then see people in community as consumers, clients, customers and patients. It then leads to silo provision. It focuses on servicing the community and for that to happen, as I said yesterday, requires a lot of people like you and I. How do we change that? Well, I want to just blow your brains apart by getting you to just listen to a 12-minute TED talk by the guy who's taught me more about this than anyone else. Do we have any Irish in the, in the audience? No one? Oh, well. Um, just enjoy his accent. I'm an amazing kind of like Irishman by the name of Cormac Russell. And Cormac has taught me more than anyone else about the new model of community building we need. Let's enjoy. Thank you. The question, can I help you, is a question that millions of people ask millions of other people every single day. What does it actually mean to help another human being, or indeed to help an entire community? I believe that helping is a powerful and often beautiful human impulse, but I also believe that helping has a shadow side, that certain styles or forms of helping are actually doing more harm than good. Roosevelt Moss Cantor, the Harvard academic, puts it beautifully when she says, that when we do change to people, they experience it as violence. But when people do change for themselves, they experience it as liberation. Today, I want to present a very simple idea. And the idea is this. If we want to help people in a way that does no harm to them and their capacities and their communities, then the best place to start is with what is strong within them and within their communities, and not with what's wrong. 
There is an abundance of evidence that calls us to this way of helping, including the 75-year study on what makes happiness possible, the longitudinal study from Harvard, which reminds us that it's best to lean into our relationships and to create community rather than lean into ourselves and money. And the work of the Kettering Foundation, which studies what happens when democracies work as they should. And indeed, here in the UK, the work of the New Economics Foundation, which has helped us to see the five ways to well-being. Still, despite the fact that thousands and thousands of pieces of evidence call us to the idea that we should start with the capacities and the abilities in people and in communities. We see this great preponderance in governmental and non-governmental programs alike around the focus and the obsession with the starting on what is wrong, what is broken, what is pathological within people. Sadly, that focus has caused huge harm to millions of people around the world, especially poor people and especially communities. And it has created four harms, unintended as they may be in particular. The first of which is, it actually takes people who we're trying to help, and it defines them not by their gifts and their capacities and what they can bring to the solution, but by their deficiencies and their problems. The second unintended consequence of this top-down obsession with what's wrong is that money, which is intended to go to those who need the help, doesn't. It actually goes to those who are paid to provide the services to those who need help. The third unintended consequence is that active citizenship, the power to take action and to respond at the grassroots level, retreats in the face of ever-increasing technocracy, professionalism, and expertise. And finally, entire neighborhoods, entire communities that have been defined as deficient start to internalize that map and believe that the only way that anything is going to change for them is when some outside expert with the right program and the right money comes in to rescue them. These are unintended harms. No caring professional wants these things to happen. But it's also clear that no community needs these things to happen. Fortunately, there's another way of thinking about helping. We can begin to actually reflect on a form of helping which starts with a focus on what's strong, not what's wrong, and literally turns our traditional ideas of helping inside out. John McKnight and Jody Kretzmann, two professors at Northwestern University in the late 80s, brought this idea into sharp focus when they spent over four years traveling almost like an odyssey across 300 neighborhoods in North America, some 20 cities. And as they went into these neighborhoods, which were largely known by others as backwaters of pathology, known by the sum of their problems, John and Jody started a different conversation. They invited people to tell them stories about how change happens from their point of view. They invited people to share stories about a time that they and their neighbors came together to make things better. And the stories they shared, some 3,000 stories in all across that four years, share, well, they brought a focus, they brought a, a way of seeing what actually is used by citizens and by people in neighborhoods to create change. They helped us to see the raw ingredients that people use to make change happen from inside out. These are the six building blocks that those communities said are the building blocks that make change happen when it's sustainable and it's endurable and it respects the assets that exist already in communities. Over the last 30 years, we've traveled across the world and from communities in Tallahassee in the USA to Torbay in the UK, we have heard the exact same report from the mouths of indigenous communities. People telling us that these are the assets that must be identified, connected, and mobilized if we're going to see real change happen in our world. Imagine what would happen if our traditional ways of helping people were flipped. If instead of focusing on what was wrong with individuals and indeed with entire communities, we started with a focus on what's strong. And then we figured out how to negotiate a new relationship 
a more respectful relationship. I think what would happen is that we would see transformation in a way that we could never have imagined. Fortunately, it's already happening. We're doing some work and we've had the privilege of coming alongside some community builders in Leeds. Leeds is a city, as you know, in the UK. And over the years, we've trained a number of community builders in the city council, but also in the neighborhood networks. In Leeds, one of the things they care deeply about is how older people can live well and age well close to home. And also how they can ensure that those that are aging do not die with an experience of loneliness and feelings of uselessness. One of the things that they've also come to understand is that there is no program and there is no service for loneliness. The only way that we can address loneliness is by building community, by building deep relationships. And so traditional models which take older people and put them together with other older people in programs for older people will not be sufficient to end loneliness. Today in Leeds, their focus is not on building a bridge between older vulnerable people and the center of their services, but on building a bridge between older people and the center of community life. Take Robin. Robin was in his mid-70s when he first came in contact with a community builder that we trained in Leeds. He had just lost his wife and he was experiencing all of the challenges and the traumas that you experience with bereavement. But the community builder that engaged with Robin didn't just listen to those emotions, though she listened. She also asked Robin what his passions were, what he cared about enough to act upon, what made his eyes dance in his head. And what Robin said when she asked those questions was, he was passionate about making walking sticks. That was his great passion, taking branches from fallen trees and carving them into walking sticks. Today, Robin is a leader of a group that he set up, made up of all age groups, who are learning how to make walking sticks and sharing those walking sticks with people in the community. The significance of the story is this. Robin is not a client in a service. Robin is a citizen at the center of his community, using his gifts along with the gifts of his neighbors to make a better community and a more inclusive community. So often when we label people as vulnerable or as deficient or as problematic, what we actually do is we define them out of community and redefine them not as friend and as neighbor, but as client in a service system. And I think that when we do that, we take some of the soul away from the person, all in the name of helping them. Sometimes we don't just do that to individuals. In many communities around the world, we've actually done it to entire villages, in some cases, entire continents. We have to figure out a way of lifting those labels which obscure the gifts of communities, the resources, the capacities, the untapped reservoir of possibility and creativity and invention that exists in every single community. If only we could focus on what was strong within them so that they could use that strength to address what's wrong. Well, one of the places where we're learning a lot about how to make those invisible resources more visible is in a place called Wirral, another place in the UK. One of our community builders has been working across the world to find the hidden treasures that exist in that community. And one of the people that we've discovered is Frank. Frank is a community artist who has such a driving passion for changing his community and for seeing the strength in every single individual. He believes that there is nobody whose gifts are not needed to create the kind of world that he believes is possible if we include everybody's gift. Frank is an artist, so he sees things through the eyes of an artist. And one of his passions is making sure that the environment looks as well as it possibly can in the world for those who live there and for those who, who visit. New Brighton Beach was one of his recent projects, and he was really disturbed by the fact that there was so much litter and detritus on the beach. He decided he wanted to mobilize. So he got his community involved. Now, most people, when they see litter, what they do is one of two things, typically. Either they organize a litter pick with volunteers, or else they lobby the council to try and get them to do something about it. Well, Frank had a different idea. Frank's idea was, to create a pirate ship. This 
is the Black Pearl. The Black Pearl today stands as one of the biggest tourist attractions on the world. But it's also a beacon of civic engagement because Frank didn't just build that boat or that ship himself. He invited people, many people who felt exactly like the driftwood that was coming onto the shore, forgotten and cast aside. He invited them to bring their gifts, to bring their gifts to creating this icon of impossibility, this, this tribute to the possibility that comes when you invite people from the grassroots to identify the solution in their own words and to create the solution with their own hands. You know, everywhere I go, I find that when people create things themselves, they, they own them in a way that you can never, ever own that which has been created for you. The pirate ship has really affected a huge transformation in that community. Needless to say, New Brighton Beach is cleaner than it's ever been, but also thousands of other below the radar initiatives that we just don't see are happening on the world because community builders are taking care to identify, connect, and mobilize the assets that exist in every community. I'm so heartened to be able to report to you that all over the world, this backyard revolution, which is shifting the focus from what's wrong with our people and our communities to what's strong within our communities and how we can build that strength to create a better tomorrow, is happening everywhere. We spent the last six years in the UK really focusing in on how we could create demonstration sites across the UK, places that were living evidence of what happens when you take the theory and you put it into practice. I'm proud to say that in May we're going to be working with our partners, the Bank of Ideas, to do the exact same thing across Australia. And there are many other countries where we're seeing this backyard revolution come into reality. Just a few weeks ago, I was very privileged to spend some time in Rwanda. I started my journey in Rwanda three and a half years ago, training community builders in the Gasabo district of Kigali, which is the capital of Rwanda. And they have been working over the last three and a half years with 49 schools and 484 villages in Kigali. I'd love to share every single one of the stories because each of them touches a human emotion within us in a very, very special way, but I don't have time. So let me just share one. This is a school where the community builder came alongside parents, people without any credentials, people who had huge self-doubt in their power to change anything. But well, the community builder invited them to identify what they cared about enough to act upon and then invited them to take action on those issues. And they identified two things that they felt really needed to change if their school and their village was to realize its potential. The two issues that they took on, the first was the fact that there were street children in each of their villages that were not connected to community, not connected to family, and not connected to school. They didn't gang press these kids into school. What they did was they came alongside them and they formed relationships with them and they found out from them what it would take for them to reconnect back into community life and back into school. And the kids said very clearly, we do not want to go to school and learn books. School is boring. Hands up who thought school was boring. I certainly did. They did not want to go to school. What they wanted to learn was how they could connect with people who were interesting, people who knew how to make tables, people who knew how to fix engines. They wanted to connect with people who didn't have any formal teacher training, but who could teach them the skills that would allow them to have a life they wanted. Today, they're in school, but it's not like any school that most of us have gone to. They're in a school that looks as much like an economic hub as it does a school. It's a school that is focused not just on educating people, but also giving people the skills they need for life. The other challenge they had was supporting teachers who lived on meager salaries, to be able to live with dignity and pride and have a morale in teaching their children. What did they do? They sourced local produce and they created a supermarket in the school so that teachers can use their salary to buy the food they need at reduced prices. These are ordinary people, uncredentialed people, doing extraordinary things. And we see this every single day when we start with a focus on what's strong, not what's wrong. Imagine what the world would look like if we were able to take those stories and to proliferate them and to look at the significance 
of the stories and see that the two things that mattered most was the grassroots action of citizens, but also the help of community builders. In each story, there was a community builder who was supporting the village and the individuals to identify what was strong within them and figuring out how to use what was strong to address what was wrong and make what was strong even stronger still. Imagine the world if everybody who was defined as the problem secured the power to redefine the problem. Imagine how more inclusive, how more beautiful a world we'd have, how more fruitful a world we'd have. You know, I believe that the solution to the most intractable problems that we face starts from the grassroots, from inside out. And it starts with a belief of the fact that there is no two-tiered society where one group of people with all of the problems are rescued by another group with all of the solutions. There is no them and us. There is only us. Lilla Watson, the great Aboriginal elder, educator, and activist, once said, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. So as we look to a brighter tomorrow, and as I conclude, let's recognize the fact that we are the people we've been waiting for. We are sufficient onto the challenge, and we are becoming the change we seek. Thank you. Pretty powerful kind of like presentation. If you want to see it, just um, Google uh, Cormac Russell TED Talk and come up. And also, what you can also um, Google, if you do that, is a transcript. He's full of some amazing one-liners there that I'm sure a few of you might want to get. And again, you can actually download it. You notice at the heart of what Cormac was talking about with these two professors, Jody Kretzman and John McKnight, these two guys that uh, travelled across America for four years and they um, were in 300 neighbourhoods and, and collected these amazing thousands upon thousands of stories. They've produced a book called Building Communities from the Inside Out, A Path Towards Finding and Mobilising a Community's Assets. It's often seen as the, uh, the classic text for all of this. Can I suggest that you don't buy it? It's the most boring book I have ever tried to read and I have yet to find one person who's ever finished reading it. So uh, um, a couple of their disciples have written much better books and I'll give you that right at the end. But these are the two guys we give all the credit to. Um, they are the ones who've got us thinking and looking through a new lens. And what they're basically saying is, you know what? Maybe there's an alternative to that model. And this is the model that they refer to as the asset-based community development model that many of us are into. Instead of the top down, why don't we start from the inside out? Instead of starting with what's wrong, let's start with what is strong. Instead of starting with disabilities, why don't we talk about abilities and capacities? Instead of looking at people as clients and as consumers, why don't we begin to look at them as, as citizens and co-owners of what's going on? Instead of focusing on silo, why don't we start moving much more into collaboration, putting a focus on relationship building? Instead of this dependence on outside professionals, why don't we have a focus on the importance of community relationships and maybe our role in facilitating all of this is what they refer to as leadership by stepping back. And it just seems to me that it is a really interesting alternative. And fundamentally what they're saying is, look, as we look at community, we've got to stop doing less of the top two, two and four. We've got to start doing more with, but above all, how do we create space of, of and by the community themselves? And it seems to me that's the quadrant that we seem to kind of like be lacking in. As I mentioned yesterday, that word client that we love to use in NGOs has a very, very kind of like uh, poor origin. It comes from a Latin word meaning, I'm on my back and I am powerless. And it seems to me that we don't need clients, we need citizens. We need everyone to believe that they need to kind of like be part of where it's actually at and so on. And so this model that Jody had and uh, John have developed fundamentally has seven key kind of like principles. It's not a recipe. There's no recipe for this. Every community is unique, different, 
but there are a set of what we call the seven critical principles. And what I just want to finish with in this session is what do we mean by them? And the first is, it's got an incredible strong kind of like asset focus. Firstly, an appreciative mindset. Mindset's the starting point, always for change in community. I love what this Catholic priest said, you know, life's different when you focus on the positive. There's more affirmation, there's more possibilities, more hope. Start a conversation where you get people asking what's wrong and what's broken. Notice how we, as Australians, love to wind ourselves down. There's no energy in that. But when you get people starting to talk about not what doesn't work, but what does work, and how do we get more of that? Boy, people start to kind of like take on a totally different thing. I love this Snoopy cartoon. Snoopy, someday we will all die. True, but on all the other days, we will not. And it seems to me that cartoon captures the different kind of like spirit that we actually need. What we focus on, according to John and, uh, and Jody, is that becomes our reality. So if we always focus on what's wrong and what's missing, we tend to see everything through that frame. And that really is at the heart of what they're doing. Now, one of my great heroes is a woman called Vicky Buck. She's the former mayor of the city of Christchurch in New Zealand, a city that was number 13 out of 14 in terms of economic reality when she became mayor. Within two years, it went from 13 down to two, and within two more years, number one in New Zealand, and it won the award as the best managed local government authority in the world. Now, how do you go from that to that? She retired just before the earthquake, has now come back, she's now the deputy mayor again, and I love any time I'm in Christchurch meeting with this woman, we become great friends and we always have a meal together and I always ask her the same question, Vicky, look, What's the role of leadership, particularly in a time of crisis like all this earthquake, post-earthquake time in, in Christchurch? And Vicky always says, Peter, the number one role of a leader is getting people talking up and not talking down. She introduced giraffe awards into the city for people who are prepared to stick out their neck and have a go. She was one of those people that whenever she gets up and speaks, she reckons part of her role is to make negative people deviants because they are incredibly destructive. I love this speech she gave. I think negative people should be taxed. They require an incredible amount of energy. They're like corgi dogs nibbling at your ankles. And I'm sure they exist to show us the difference between heaven and hell. You know, that's how she talked. And as I said, that positivity does play a role. This is one of her favorite quotes. There's a little difference in people, but that little difference makes a big difference. That little difference is attitude. The big difference is whether it's positive or negative. And it seems to me that positivity and getting people focused on what works and on the half full bit of the glass really does move people. A strength-based approach has power, kind of like in it. Another one of her great quotes, when going after Moby Dick in the rowing boat, bring along the tartare sauce. Unfortunately, I used that in the local government conference recently and Greenpeace were in the audience. They didn't really appreciate that one. But, um, and so when we move into community, there's always kind of like ways that we interact with community. And certainly there are two types of questions. And can I tell you, the bottom set leads to far more positive outcomes than the top set. Much more powerful when you get people starting to talk about the half full, not the half empty bit of the glass. So, is the glass half full or is it kind of like half empty? How many people think that glass is half? How many people think it's half empty? You'd be ideologically stupid, wouldn't you, in a, after everything I've said to admit to that? <laughs> How many people think it's half full? How many people don't think? <laughs> How many people think it's both? I do. That glass is both half full and half empty. But the one thing that Jody Kretzman taught me is you can't do much with the top half. It's the bottom half. That actually gives you something to work with. And so why do we spend so much of our energy getting people into needs analysis and all that type of stuff when what we've got to get people into is discovering what is it that does actually work? Now, we can't ignore the top half. We know that in every community there's a whole heap of things that don't work. But you know what I found? Communities don't need a lot of time discussing that. They know what doesn't work. It takes communities usually 20 seconds to give me that map. They don't need a lot more conversation about that. But what they do need some conversation about is that map called the asset map. 
And we need both maps. They're both important. We do need to know in every community there are things that are broken. There is domestic violence. There is kind of like youth unemployment. There is a whole pile of issues that we can't ignore. But it seems to me to get there, to do something about those needs, this is the map that works. And yet so few people take time out to do that. And with that comes this whole thought that every community is incredibly kind of like asset rich. And these are the six assets that we believe exist in every kind of like community. There are, above all, the people kind of like assets. And the most important thing about that is simply what is it that people care about? You know, when we ask that question, what is it you care about? What's your contribution? That's what we invite then participation around. Incredibly important to discover that. There's the physical world. There's all of those kind of like community and networking associations, formal and informal. You know, I belong to a church group. I belong to a kayaking group. It's really an excuse for a drinking group. They're kind of like communities. There's a whole heap of them. Each of us in every community is a whole pile of formal and informal. There are institutional assets. Most geographic communities have a school, have a police station, have a hospital, have a whole pile of institutional assets. You know, when we discover what a local primary school has, it's, you know, got so much asphalt, fantastic for festivals, got more toilets than any local government authority would ever expect you to have. It's got teachers and above all, it's got students. Wow, it's got all of these amazing assets. How do we use those for community? And then there's the economic and business assets, the formal, the informal business life that goes on. And finally, every community has stories and traditions and heritage. And all of those things represent incredible assets. And all of them need to be mapped. Lovely example. I don't know if you've been into Western, uh, kind of like Victoria, where for years and years, in fact, 120 years, these silos lay there, rusty kind of like things. All of those towns dying. And then along comes this woman comes back and looks at those towns with fresh eyes. Everyone for 120 years had seen them as a rusty thing. But when she returned back there, she actually saw them as this amazing canvas that can be used. And then she noticed that uh, not only did her town have them, but a whole pile of other towns. And so she put together this amazing kind of like silo art to, uh, trail. And boy, that set of kind of like six towns have just come alive. It's estimated up to 30,000 people every weekend from Melbourne are now touring and spending money. In the little town of Brim, they hadn't had a coffee shop there, I think, for seven years. They've now got three of them and whatever. And what have they simply done is they've taken a physical asset and linked it to kind of like their cultural assets. And every one of them have kind of like just done it in their unique way to create this amazing trail. All flood lit at night, amazing what they've actually done. But it just looked, took one person to look with fresh eyes at what people for 120 years had been staring at and hadn't seen it as an asset. And I love what Cormac says, at the end of the day, you cannot possibly know what a community needs until first they know what they've got. Seems we get things back to front in terms of where we go. The second thing is this is strongly citizen driven, not service driven. This is about putting people who live in our communities at the heart of it. And it seems to me that for many of us, we've got to actually begin to believe that particular kind of like statement. And one of the things that I think Mike Green has also helped us understand, that every community that's getting stronger has at its heart an effort to build up a wider circle of people who choose to take action for the common good. That's part of the process that we've got to engage. How do we get more and more people excited about being part of this citizen-driven type of initiative? And the best example I know, one of the great sponsors of this particular conference is the community banking movement. Back there at the turn of the century, the four big banks in this country, and boy, we've worked out in the last couple of months what they've been up to. But you know, over a five-year period back then, they decided to close down 5,000 bank branches and sack 15,000 staff. Not because any of these banks were losing money. This was all about making more money. So if you can sell off property, if you can cull your staff, you can get people onto regional and internet banking, you can return more to the shareholder. And consequently, over 5,000 communities suddenly found they no longer had a bank. 
And when you don't have a bank and people are going to drive to the regional centre to do their banking, they tend to do other things there. They go to the supermarket, they go to the doctor there. They start doing a whole pile of others. And what tended to happen is a whole pile of towns, particularly across wheat belt areas, places like in the Central Air Peninsula, all started to collapse. Then comes along this group called Bendigo Bank. It had started during the gold rushes in the 1850s as a housing cooperative. It then became a community bank and then it got a banking licence. And it came to these communities and said, you know what, we got a deal for you. We know that your bank didn't close down because it was losing money. It was all about making more money. And we also know that the bank often is the most profitable business in town. Why don't you come, why don't we come up together and create our own community bank? Why don't you own your own bank and you will get back 50% of all of the profit to do with whatever you like. Sounds a fantastic deal. And consequently, we've had 315 communities across Australia took up the challenge. The Bendigo Bank tell me 10,000 communities have rung them, because it sounds a fantastic deal, but why is it only 315 have done it? Why? Because it's a pretty tough deal. You've actually got to raise now a million dollars in local shareholding. You've got to convince your neighbours to pledge a movement of in excess of four million dollars in accounts to this new bank. Not an easy option. And for it to happen, a dedicated group of people had to sit out the front of kind of like their local co-op on a Friday night and Saturday morning and flog kind of like shares to the neighbours, convince people. Move from the Commonwealth that you and your family have known for 100 years to this new thing none of us really know much about. But you know the exciting thing is that 315 pulled it off. I find that amazing. Not one of them got a government grant to do this. There was no program saying, here's money to kind of like you become a community bank. People had to do it themselves. And the exciting thing is today, those kind of like uh, banks between them have $35 billion on their books the most exciting thing is 160 million has been given back. And all of that story is less than 18 years old. It's an amazing story. It just shows what community can do. And the interesting thing is these are small country towns and poor urban communities. And they did it. Amazing story. So when people say community can't do it, I say, look at the greatest economic, community economic movement this country has ever seen. And what I find now exciting is that these banks think they can do anything. I was out in Western Queensland the other week, and this group said, we own the bank, we're now going to start up our own community airline service. We haven't had an airline service for 30 years. But we think we can have a weekly flight now into Brisbane. Run a bank, certainly can run a airline. I love this group. Second nicest town in Australia after the one you come from is a little place called Mount Barker down there in the Plantagenet area. They've got a community bank. They've had it now for 10 years. They have a modest return back. They're returning back $100,000 a year to their, uh, their community. Every year they have a community conversation to talk about how to use that $100,000. Someone said about five years ago, look, we had the crummiest health centre of any country town in Australia. It's a 1950s asbestos building. It's, it, uh, we can't keep a doctor in town. We have really a lack of community health services. Why don't we put our $100,000 into health? Now, those of you from the health system would know it would be like pouring water into sand. $100,000 doesn't go too far when it comes to our health service. But someone said, we've only got 100000 but we have a partner in this. It's called the Bendigo Bank in Bendigo. They know our books better than anyone. Why don't we go to them and ask them for a loan of a million dollars and we'll pay them back 100000 a year for 10 years. And Bendigo said, yeah, let's go for it. So they now got a million dollars. And when you've got a million dollars, you can storm your local council meeting on the first Tuesday of the month and literally dumping cash on the table, a million dollars, saying, there's our million, where's your million? And they bullied the council into coming up with a second million. So they now have two million. And when you've got two million, you can certainly go to the feds and to the state and request another two million. And today, they have a four million dollar health centre in that little town of two and a half thousand people. They now have three permanent doctors. They couldn't even keep one under the old system, they have three. 
and they have a range of allied health services that any town of two and a half thousand people would give their right arm. You know, communities can do anything. How do we get back to this type of kind of like relationship with what we do? The third thing is that every single person, this is a conference about inclusion. This is about recognising that everyone has a contribution. And you know what? People need that in terms of living a full life. I mentioned yesterday, what is the World Health Organization's definition of positive mental health? It's at the heart of kind of like the biggest health issue we face in this country. This is one of the great stories I've ever seen. This guy, Damon Lynch III, black um, Baptist minister, the only Baptist minister I've ever met that has a ponytail right down past his bum. I haven't seen a Baptist minister like that before. Amazing guy. But he works in one of the roughest neighbourhoods in Cincinnati. And every night of the week, that church runs an interesting service. It's called a soup kitchen. Now, I have huge respect for people who run soup kitchens. I think it's one of the ultimate expressions in compassion. But to be really honest, most soup kitchens are community feeding centres. People come in each night, they come out of the weather, we give them a meal. I've worked as a volunteer in one. They have the meal, they go out, we feel good, they've got their tummies filled, but next night they're back. And we provide a meal, we take them out of the elements of the weather, they go out, we feel good. But you know what? Next night they're back. Their lives are not really changing. The day I walked into this one, I noticed it was totally different. This was not a community feeding centre. This was a community eating centre. And the difference being is I couldn't work out who were the churches and who were the homeless and unemployed. This was one great big family organising an amazing feast and meal every night. And then things happened in the middle of that meal that I'd never seen in a soup kitchen before. They had their own resident jazz band. They had their own resident comedian. They had a woman get up and do the most amazing country and western numbers. I'd never seen that in a soup kitchen before. And I thought, you know what, there's something different about this one. And I'll never forget having then a conversation with Damon Lynch. And I said, Damon, tell me, what, why is this different? And he said, well, if you'd been here six months ago, you would have seen a typical soup kitchen. 200 homeless and unemployed come in, we feed them, they go out next night, they're back. And we went on with that model until I made the ultimate mistake. I decided to employ a typical Generation Y young woman. You know what they like? They want to change everything within five minutes. And so this woman, Judith, started questioning how we were doing things. Really annoyed me, he said. One night she said, you know, Pastor, we do a good job, but guess what, Pastor? Their lives are not changing. And do you know why, Pastor, their lives are not changing? Because we do not know them. Damon said, I was furious. I've been here six years, she's been here six minutes. But the more I reflected on her comments, the more I realised she was right. So what did he do? He had another kind of like asset in his church. They called Young Women and Men... And he taught him a technique called appreciative inquiry. Has anyone used the tool? About one. Have a look at it. It's a way of holding a conversation where you drill into the positive core of the person or the group rather than the, the negative thing. And what he taught this group of 14, 15 year olds, 20 of them to do, was to go in over two weeks and just sit and have a meal with the 200 homeless and unemployed, but use questions like that to start the conversation. Now, what do you notice about the questions? This is classic, what we call AI, appreciative inquiry. Well, the first thing I notice is not one of them has got anything to do with homelessness, not one of them's got anything to do with unemployment. They're all to do with what's good about you and what's your contribution. It's all about bringing out the best in people. And you know, after two weeks, what happened? The first thing they discovered was out of 200 people, over 100 of them said they liked cooking. And we're a soup kitchen where 25 church members came in and delivered the service. He said, immediately sacked all of them and invited 25 from the group to take over all the catering. He said, within three months, every single one of those people was working somewhere in the hospitality industry. It wasn't meant to be an employment program, but it just happened to follow on. Why did I see a jazz band in the corner that night? Because out of 51 people... Out of 200, sorry, 51 of them had played a musical instrument at some stage in their life, and we just connected them up. I had a conversation that night with a guy who said, as a young person, I love fishing. 
I've been through police checks and I now take a single person, a single, um, I take two boys from a single family where there isn't an adult male role model and I take them fishing once a week. That's my contribution. And in the words of Damon Lynch III, we were feeding folks but not getting to know them. And that's very much at the heart of it. I then came back to Australia and I had the most horrific phone call of my life. An uncle who I'd never seen for 30 years since he left. He was the kind of like wild man in our family. Took off, became a truckie across Australia, became, became alcoholic, became drug dependent. And I suddenly, after 30 years, get a phone call out of the blue from the Fremantle Hospital to say, you know, that uncle you haven't seen for 30 years, well, he's lying on a bed covered in bed sores. We've just amputated both of his legs. He's a chronic diabetic. He's crying incessantly. And we just had to give him the sad news. He's got six months to live. And he's asked if we can track you down as his nephew, the only relative he can remember, to see if there's any way you could take him home back to kind of like where we were living, a place called York in the Wheatbelt in WA. Horrific phone call to get. The family responded amazingly well. The whole town rallied. The local little hospital there gave up one of their staff rooms so he could have a room because he had to be on a machine three times a day. And so Les came back to York. And all the conversations through the whole town was about poor old Les and all about his disabilities. But one day, an orderly bounces into his room, sits on his bed and says to Les, listen, mate, everyone wants to talk about your disabilities. I'm here to have a chat about your abilities, mate. Our town is in trouble. We no longer have a courier between Perth and York, and you know more about the trucking business, the courier business, than any other person in town, mate. You need to go into business. You need to start up a courier business. Now, here's a guy lying on his back, been told he's got less than six months to live, and this idiot is telling him to start up a business. But that night when I saw Les, it's the first time I've ever seen him smiling. He said to me, Peter, I'm going into business. I said, what? He said, I'm going into business. I'm going to start up a courier business. He said, I've already had the men's shed in here and they reckon they can modify a car that I can drive without legs. They can modify an attachment at the back I can put the trailer on. I've had the printer in here and he's printing up cards that say, you pack it, you unload it, I'll simply deliver it. And he said, you know what? I've also discovered I've got an amazing asset. You know what I'm going to call my business? Legless Les's courier business. <laughs> and it was an incredible winter. He painted his own sign. And you know the exciting thing? He didn't live for six months. He lived for six years. And in the last year of his life, he moved into his own apartment. He had such confidence about it. They had no more need to think about, we've got to discover what people's kind of like gifts are all about. And I think the question for all of us is, whose gifts are underutilised in the community? And I guarantee they have a label attached to them. And it seems to me that we've got to remove the label and see these as people with so much to offer. And that's a group that I really care about that don't ever seem to get mobilised in many of our communities. They're called young women and men. I love Chloe. She's in Port, kind of like Macquarie. She's got a really bizarre hobby. She only needs a rake from Bunnings that costs $3.99. And where do you find her every night? Down the beach, doing these amazing beach designs. What an amazing contribution of pride to that community. She's 16 years old. Wow. Every young person has amazing gifts. Ugly Water Tower in a Central Australian community, a group that most of the whiteys in the town are petrified of, young Indigenous men. Those men have a gift and you bring the two together and wow. Kind of like exciting stuff can start to actually happen in our community. My great hero as an ageing person, Edna Freeman. For 38 years, Edna has run the Gentle Gym Club in the city of Geraldton. You know how old she is? 99, and she's still running, kind of like the gym club. Everyone has contributions that they can actually make. And the key asset we need to discover is what people care about. Therefore, the key question is what matters, is not what matters to you, or what matters to you, not what's the matter. We're so good at asking people what's the matter when really the question's got to be what matters to you. So one of the things that we do a lot of is working with communities on their big ideas. The weekend after the first big earthquake in Christchurch, 
I was part of this thing where we asked people in Christchurch, what's your big idea for Christchurch? And in one weekend, we got 106,000 post-it note suggestions of what could be done to build the new Christchurch. And I can guarantee that over 99% of them was, here's my big idea for someone else to do for us. We've now changed our model. We still use the big idea card. And on the back, we had my big idea for the community is, and we're now slipped in a new line and I could contribute to making it happen by. Guess what? We get less ideas, but we get much more powerful ideas because people have contributed to how it might happen. Simple ways we can do it different. I love this story. Here's a young woman. She's kind of like only a 35, professional woman. A little girl goes to the local Catholic school for the first time. She feels as... A dedicated mum, she should go to the annual general meeting of the PNF. She turns up and she finds there's only 12 of them sitting in this meeting, despite the fact there's 200 families at the school, but only 12 come to the annual general meeting. She's the only one staring at the front when they call for people to go on the committee. They can't find a president, she finds herself the secretary, and the treasurer makes that immortal words, look, I'll do it for one more year, but I'm putting the organisation on standby. This is my last year. She turns up at a first committee meeting. There's only, only three of them at the meeting. The treasurer, her, and a zealous principal that has a list this long of all the things he's hoping the PNF would do to help the school. Typical. Only 5% of people get involved as a family in the local PNC or PNF. Jeanette knows that's not possible. She said, this is impossible. So that night, she did a really interesting thing. She actually got the principal to make a list of all the things that he was hoping that the PNF would help. There was stuff to do in the social, the pastoral, resourcing, and the fundraising area. And then she wrote a letter to every family in that school, and she just called it just one thing. This is your kid's school, and we're asking you to just do one thing for the whole year. Not asking you to go on a committee, but would you help out with one thing? And guess what? Within two weeks, 60% of families responded back, and over half of them chose more than one thing. Now, the previous year, 5%, which is already up to 60%. But Jenna's not happy. She then writes to the 40% who still hadn't responded, saying, you must have missed my first letter. I'm writing to you again. Are you willing to just do one thing? And she gets a further... 15% uh, engagement. She's now up to 75% of people in that school are contributing. Amazing. She's not happy. She then rings the 25% who still hadn't responded, saying, you must have missed my first letter and my second letter. I'm now ringing you. And she gets a further 10% engagement. And so last year in that school, 85% of families contributed to the functioning of the PNF. What's the lesson? Allow people to choose what they want to do. Get people realising they don't need to be on a committee. It's an amazing little egg sample. And yesterday I shared that. Why do people volunteer? Well, the number one reason is someone who they knew asked them to do something they like doing. And the secret is you've got to know what people like doing. Number four, this is strongly place-based. We talked about that yesterday. And it seems to me that the more that we can move down towards that collaborative thing, the more powerful will be kind of like our uh, approach and whatever in terms of where we're at. Those of you who are really looking at the ultimate, certainly, as I said, this whole approach called collective impact using those five conditions, really worth looking at. As I said, it's really just a wanky term for good old-fashioned collaboration. But what's different about it is that there are these five critical conditions that actually people have got to commit to. Really smart way of getting collaboration. Number five, we've got to get more in and realise that community building is fundamentally all about relationship building. And we've got to realise relationships are really at the heart of everything that we do. And if we, as people in terms of sport, with the organisations we work for, if we're interested in civic engagement, social connected, you know, um, we want better schools, safer streets, people living stronger and healthy lives. That are the things we all want here. Well, the one thing we can't ignore 
is it's fundamentally about people's connection with each other is at the heart of it. What's the current Mayor of Christchurch saying about the people who cope best with the earthquake? Not people had a plan, not people had the emergency supplies, but people who simply had good relationships with their neighbours. That's at the heart of it. We know the more people know each other's first name in a community, the safer it is. You know, if you know the neighbours on either side and the people across the road and they know you go off to work at, at 8-ish in the morning, back at 5.30ish at night, you're reduced by 80% your chances of being a victim of crime in that street. Makes sense that we need to kind of like begin to realise. And then this one. I'm on a school board. I said to my principal the other day, listen, principal, I can help you with two things, but you can only have one. Haven't got a lot of time. I'm happy to try to organise $5 million more for the school so you can have more teachers and more educational resources. Or I can come up with a way that we can get 400 more families engaged in the life of the school. Which one principle do you want? Which will lead to better educational outcomes? You know what she said? Give me the money. You know what does lead to better educational outcomes? Overwhelmingly, the evidence tells us 400 more engaged families would lead to far better education. And you want people to live longer? Well, it isn't all about exercise. It is about social connection. Your own Department of Health at Uni, Uni of Flinders kind of like has told us that. The stuff about connection is so important. I love what these two doctors said. People who lack social and community ties are much more likely to die. Well, we know that. Joining a community group, believe it or not, cuts in half your odds of dying next year. We should all rush out and sign up for a few more groups after the conference today. But joining a community organisation for fun was better for health than giving up smoking. Amazing. So in the words of Putnam, as a rule of thumb, if you belong to no group and decide to join one, you cut your risk in dying over the next year in half. If you smoke and belong to no group, it's toss up statistically whether you should stop smoking or start joining. That thing about people and being connected just really, really matters. And therefore, at the heart of this whole thing is not connecting people to your service, but connecting people to their community. Pretty easy. We have a whole pile of FIFO workers in one of our suburbs. Uh, we're close to the airport. Their partners are up in the Pilbara. Many women are there, isolated, two, three, four kids, many of them without any transport. The health nurse said to a group of us, why don't we just do something once a month and try to bring these people together? So what we've done is we've taken over one of our reserves. The local council tried to charge us $500. We said, we're not paying. You can stand at the gate and charge people individually if you like, um, but we'll have a photographer there, kind of like, it'll make a great kind of like local article in the local newspaper. Or you can allow these women to just accidentally turn up and start connecting. We ask them to bring a plate of food, a blanket and a smile. How many women do you think turn up on the first Tuesday of every month? Ordinary suburb, probably 4,000 people in it. How many women do you think we get? 60, 70? Try 500. You know, it's so easy to get people to want to connect. Just need someone to open the doors and windows for people. People do want to connect. And often it's just about getting them together. The sixth thing is, this is strongly conversation orientated, and that's one of the most powerful quotes I know. One of the things that we need to learn is that every great change starts from very small conversations held amongst people who care. And so I think that one of the great um, roles that we've got to play is to hold meaningful and host meaningful conversations. Let's not have meetings, let's go where people are. I love this one that we recently did down in the city of Albany. We called it a thousand kind of like cups of coffee and a hundred conversations. And we simply got people as they came into the shopping centre, getting them to talk about what they cared about, what they loved. We had a love tree there that they could kind of like hold their things. And in three mornings, we had 1,600 people engaged in conversation. And we certainly did come up clearly. I love this group in Eltham. They're a group of potters. They're potty. What have they done? They've created the community tea set. They're now running a tea party with 25 groups across Eltham, simply using um, coasters that have little questions about what do you love about living in Eltham? What is it that we've got to make sure we keep in Eltham? What have we got to retain? What would we want to start up that we don't currently have? I just think what a great way to kind of like get people using their gifts and whatever. And the most interesting, we're almost finished, John. 
Um, we'll be there in two minutes. Most interesting thing is get people into meaningful conversation. Here's a community with an amazing heritage asset. You know what they do once a year? They close off the traffic and have a long table, kind of like lunch, and on the tablecloth they're getting people talking about where do they want their community to go and what am I willing to contribute to making it actually happen. Much more interesting than calling people to a meeting. And the final thing is have fun in terms of where we're at. The 10 reasons why we found with the firefighters in New South Wales they give up being a volunteer, well, you can see there are 10 reasons. But what was number one? It stopped being fun. <coughs> it seems to me the heart of keeping people engaged is having fun. And so, at the end of the day, there's no kind of like recipe for running the stuff. There's just five, seven kind of like critical principles. How we apply them will vary from community to community. But these are the five, seven things that really kind of like make a difference. So that's the end of the sermon bit for the day. We're now going to break. And what I do, I want to come back and I want to practice some of these things in terms of a pile of exercises and whatever. So we're going to break for 24 minutes. And uh, if we can come back here in 24 minutes, that would be good. Thank you.